pleasure to introduce our first speaker, um, Dr. Wollen. And some of you may know Dr. Wollen as um, who actually created the neuroendocrine tumor program at Cedar sinai He was here for 26 years. And hot off the press, it didn't even make the program because it just happened a couple of days ago. Uh, you may know of an amazing organization called the Carcinoid Cancer Foundation based on the East Coast. Dr. Wong was just named the co-director of the neuroendocrine tumor program at Carcinoid Cancer uh, Foundation. So let's give him a warm hand. And this is for those of you who don't know that organization, it is very prestigious. You can go to the website carcinoid.org. It's one of the best websites around for carcinoid, um, thanks to Grace Goldstein who runs it. And um, they're doing incredible work in education, bringing groups together, um, promoting research that's being done, and just being a resource for patients. Um, so please welcome Dr. Wallen. Thank you, Giovanna. First of all, it's a really a great honor and privilege to be able to speak to you today and to be here among so many friends and colleagues. I want to thank Cedar sinai Medical Center and the uh, NET Research Foundation for inviting me, and we're going to talk about things. The subject that we're going to be speaking about today is neuroendocrine cancer, a year in review, 2015 and 2016. So much has happened in the last year that it is just remarkable, but also realize that everything that we know about treating neuroendocrine cancers and carcinoids has all happened in the last few years. When I started out, there was not one drug approved for neuroendocrine cancer in the United States, and the most common treatment was so-called watch and wait, which led to a life expectancy of something like three years. And since that time, so many treatments have happened, People are living many, many fold longer and much higher quality of life and every day and every year, very important new advances happen. So what I'll do is, tell you that treating neuroendocrine cancer is clearly a multidisciplinary effort and I think you'll see that over the course of the day. Each one of these specialties playing a critical role I'm going to be focusing primarily on systemic treatments. I'm a medical oncologist, but you have to realize that every one of these medical specialties also has many, many advances, many of which have happened in the last year or two that are just totally changing the way we diagnose and treat the disease and its symptoms. So I just want to put this in perspective. Also, by talking about new advances, I'm going to be touching on many different subjects and many different types of treatment. I'm trying to give you an overview of the whole situation, but in many of these areas you'll be hearing specific lectures going into much more detail over the course of the day. And we'll also have a lot of time for questions. These are all the treatments for treating carcinoid cancer which have been proven to be effective in prospective randomized trials and approved uh, for therapy. The earliest one was streptozosin for pancre pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Streptozosin is a chemotherapy which we don't use uh, very often today because we have other things that are easier and less toxic, but that was approved for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors in the 80s. That was the first time we had anything. Octreotide LAR in midgut tumors was proven to be an effective way of controlling cancer using a somatostatin analog. It's not approved for that purpose in the United States. It's approved for treating the symptoms of carcinoid syndrome, flushing and diarrhea, but we know from this study that it does have anti-tumor effects. Everolimus was shown in the Radian 3 trial to be a very effective drug in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, was approved in 2011, and the same time sunitinib was approved for uh, pancreatic tumors. Lanreotide, was just approved as we're approaching 2015 in the common era that we're talking about. It was approved in the very end of 2014, 
based on a trial known as Clarinet. Everolimus again approved for intestinal and lung carcinoids just last year. And now we finally have data from the Netter-1 randomized trial of PRRT with OTCM-177 dotatate that that's a very effective treatment for neuroendocrine tumors, not yet approved in the United States, but available investigationally and clearly shown to be very active. We'll be talking about the situation. The first thing I want to do is talk about new developments in the last two years related to the somatostatin receptor. Neuroendocrine cancers have on their surface a particular membrane feature known as a somatostatin receptor. And this somatostatin receptor is able to bind very tightly to a hormone in the body, a natural hormone called somatostatin. Somatostatin is a peptide hormone. It has the property that it stops the secretion of hormones by endocrine cells. For example, some of the hormones that cause carcinoid syndrome and other hormone secretion syndromes. But in addition, it stops the neuroendocrine cancer from growing. It acts as a chemotherapy, if you like, as an anti-tumor drug. And we can take advantage of this property. The downside of somatostatin is that it lives in the body only for two or three minutes maximum, and then it gets destroyed. So it doesn't make a very effective pharmaceutical drug. So what has happened is somatostatin analogs were created. The picture on the left is um, a picture of the somatostatin molecule. The amino acids in orange are what we call the binding site. That's the part of the molecule that sticks to the somatostatin receptor on the neuroendocrine cancer and exerts its action. To increase the half-life, very slight modifications in the molecule were made, which you see on the picture on the right, and that's what we call somatostatin analogs. Lanreotide and octreotide are ones we'll be talking about. There are other ones, pazeriotide. Other molecules are used as well. The study that was done that really changed the way we treat neuroendocrine cancer was with called uh, lanreotide was called clarinet. This is a trial many of you in this audience have been part of, a randomized trial of lanreotide versus placebo with the caveat that anybody randomized to placebo is then able to get lanreotide following. So during the time of this trial, it was the way that people were able to receive the new drug. In summary, this is the first time a randomized trial of somatostatin analog that was proven to be effective. It included all kinds of intestinal and pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. It prolonged progression-free survival markedly. The time cancer was able to be controlled was increased to 33 months. On the average, and many patients, even five or 10 years later, still have control of their cancer. This is the difference between the people that got lanreotide and the people who didn't. In this uh, time it was published, the average time of cancer control had not even been reached compared to the control. Now we know it's about 33 months average. In addition, a study was done with lanreotide to control carcinoid syndrome. As you know, the somatostatin analog, which is now approved for carcinoid syndrome, is octreotide. But it turns out lanreotide is also very effective. A complete resolution of the diarrhea in flushing happened in 40% of people who got lanreotide versus 23% who did not. Another study with lanreotide based on patient satisfaction, known as the SYNMET trial, was done. And you can see that almost all the patients, 76% of them, were very, very happy with the diarrhea reduction. In many cases, people that were homebound because of fear of uh, problems with bowel movements were now able to live a quite normal life. A new trial has just been launched using lanreotide in lung carcinoid tumors. We have this uh, available now. And for people who have a lung carcinoid tumor, whether it's a typical type, an atypical type of carcinoid tumor of the lung, as long as you have not yet had either lanreotide or octreotide therapy, you'd be eligible to receive the lanreotide without charge on this clinical trial. There's a new somatostatin analog, which I wanted just briefly to bring to your attention because new information has just come out also in the last uh, year or two. Pazeriotide is a drug which sticks to more types of somatostatin receptors than octreotide and lanreotide. And in a randomized trial, 
that was originally set up to control the symptoms actually looked like in a small trial was quite effective in prolonging cancer control and we have to see uh, where that's going to go. Another thing that we are now doing with somatostatin receptors is using the somatostatin analog to stick to the somatostatin receptor and then bring with it a payload of goodies because we have the, the active site of the molecule in this time instead of painting them orange they're blue but this is the part that sticks to the somatostatin receptor the blue it's attached to what we call a chelating agent that holds a heavy metal in this case a radioactive heavy metal called lutetium 177 it's all very tightly bound up in one unit and when this sticks to the cancer it's able to deliver the radiation into the cancer a very, very potent way of giving highly targeted radiation right into the cancer without nuking the rest of the body. It's like a molecular cruise missile with a molecular nuclear warhead on it going straight into the cancer and nuking it. In addition, if we substitute another kind of radioactive isotope right here, instead of a lethal ray coming out, we can have an imaging ray to make pictures and the imaging isotope we use is called gallium-68. So if we have exactly the same molecule and put in gallium-68, we get gallium-68, dota octreotate. This is called dota, gallium-68. And if we then make a scan with this, a PET scan, we have extraordinary sensitivity and detail. So this is really something to um, be on the lookout for. This is another picture of how we're doing this. Target means somatostatin receptors on the neuroendocrine cell. Ligand means somatostatin analog. And it's connected to either the reporting unit, which is gallium-68, to report where the tumor is by shooting out a ray that allows a picture to be taken, or a cytotoxic unit, a cell-killing unit, which in this case is lutetium-177, that's able to kill the cancer. You release this into the blood. The octreotide sticks to the somatostatin receptor and away it goes. This is another picture of how PRRT works. Intravenous injection of octreotide. The radioactive substance, the brand name is Lutathera, the lutetium-177 octreotate is actually not when it sticks to the cell, it gets incorporated inside the cell the cell eats it up, so it's stuck. And after it's inside the cell, it starts sticking, um, shooting the cell with radioactive rays, which get the cell in the immediate uh, vicinity sort of cells, and it causes breaks in the DNA, mutations, and the cells die. Highly targeted therapy. To evaluate the effectiveness in a controlled clinical trial, a study was done called NETR1, You'll be hearing a lot more about this later, but the NETR1 trial involved half of the people getting the radioactive octreotide, so-called lutetium-177 dotatate. The other group got a double dose of regular octreotide, and then the patients were followed to see what happened. And what happened is extraordinary. This is um, the abstract that was presented. The final manuscript is in press. And actually, uh, I'm involved in this, and also Dr. Um, Hendafar is sharing in the authorship of this as well. This is the difference in what happened with control of cancer. At the end of the study, most of the patients remained in remission with no cancer progression, and the cancer progression median time has not been reached yet. If you extrapolate the curve, it looks like it's about 40 months is what it'll end up being, cancer control, with just four shots intravenously. It's, a, it's a remarkable. The people that got double-dose octreotide, the average time of cancer control was 8.4 months. Huge difference. This has been very impressive to the FDA, and we're hoping that by next year we will have this treatment for more general use. We still have it available, but on a clinical trial. It is also remarkable that survival looks like it's improved by this drug. 
We want to wait for more years before we can guarantee that survival is improved, but it sure looks like it. 35 deaths in the group that got octreotide versus 13 in the people that got the radioactive octreotide PRRT, making it um, really the first time we have a treatment that really has prolonged survival by that amount. Right now, that trial is closed, and there is a trial known as the expanded access trial, using exactly the same regimen in the same way with four injections of the radioactive octreotide, the lutetium-177 dotatate, for people that have metastatic disease, who have a well-differentiated tumor. This is a pathology definition for a well-differentiated tumor. Any progression on a somatostatin analog, so if you have ever had octreotide or lanreotide and tumor has grown, for adult patients, and for patients who have somatostatin receptors on their tumor, because if you don't have somatostatin receptors on your tumor, the uh, radioactive uh, medication is unable to stick. You're required to have somatostatin receptors so the somatostatin analog can stick to the, the cancer cells. The way we prove that you have somatostatin receptors is either by getting an Octrea scan, which is old technology, or a gallium-68 dotatate scan, which is new technology and far more sensitive, and you'll be hearing more about that today, using the principle that I just told you of putting gallium-68 into that um, chelating agent attached to octreotate. This is a difference in the kinds of images you see with an octrea scan versus a gallium-68 PET. Every one of these black dots is a tumor, and you just have enormously more sensitivity. You also can see where every single one of the tumors is on a PET scan, which is superimposed, so the tumors just light up, and you can see them so clearly. This is a, PET a normal CAT scan. You don't see anything, but on the treatment uh, with the gallium-68 scan, you see them so clearly. You see this patient get treated with peptide receptor radiotherapy with lutetium-177. One cycle of treatment, two cycles of treatment already in a remission. When that patient relapses, you find it here way before you see it on a CAT scan. So this is a remarkably sensitive imaging test. And as far as I'm concerned, the Octrea scan is already obsolete technology, and hopefully we'll see that retired in the near future. Okay? In addition, the gallium-68 scan is done in one day. Instead of having to go in a lot of days, it's done in less than an hour. The radiation exposure is less than an Octrea scan. There's really no advantage at all to an Octrea scan. This is the gold standard now. When I was here at Cedar sinai I also had a UCLA appointment, and along with Dr. Herman, who's going to be speaking uh, later today about gallium-68 uh, imaging, we, together with UCLA, treated 100 patients. The intended management changed in 60% of patients. This is remarkable. People who were ready to have surgery that had surgery canceled, people thought to have metastatic disease didn't, people who didn't think they had metastatic disease did, people that were going to have a liver transplant said, no, we can't have a liver transplant because we have all this disease outside the liver. Many, many things came up that we would not have known. The bottom line, it changed management in 60%. So I think that is remarkable and again shows how valuable this test is. Most of these patients had already had a regular Octrea scan. And despite that, the gallium scan provided so much more information that it was uh, practice changing. The FDA just approved this test November 1st, 2016, literally a few weeks ago. Uh, billing codes will be out soon for general use, and meanwhile, it's still available investigationally at multiple places, including at UCLA in this area and in other parts of the country. It's available as well, including at, uh, at our institution in New York. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about the new developments that have happened with Everolimus. Everolimus is an extraordinary drug. It's a drug that targets a mutation and a molecular pathway found in neuroendocrine cells. It's itself an antibiotic, actually. It's not a normal chemotherapy. It originally comes from something called Serolimus which was discovered in the dirt of the Easter Islands, where somebody was out looking at all the big heads and uh, brought some dirt home in a little bag and cultured a fungus 
that made an antibiotic, just like streptomycin comes from streptomyces fungus, it made an antibiotic, which was named rapamycin after Rapa Nui, which is the big island in Easter Islands where this was found. The generic name of rapamycin is serolemus. A user-friendly pharmaceutical was made out of serolemus and it's called everolemus. And that drug is uniquely uh, wonderful in treating neuroendocrine cancer. In a randomized trial in pancreatic neuroendocrine cancer, comparing everolemus versus no everolemus, the time the cancer was able to be controlled was extended from 5.4 months to 11 months. This was done and published in uh, 2011. But now, this is for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. We didn't have absolutely conclusive proof in carcinoid tumors until this past year, when the results of the so-called Radiant 4 trial became available, a trial many of you were participating in. The Radiant 4 trial compared Everolemus versus placebo in people who had lung neuroendocrine tumors and intestinal neuroendocrine tumors. We already knew that it works in pancreas. And what happened? It also had an average progression-free survival of 11 months versus about four months in the people who didn't get it. A marked improvement, and based on that, the FDA rather quickly approved it, and we now have it available for all these different types of neuroendocrine cancer, for lung, pancreas, and all the intestinal sites. Everolemus goes by the brand of Affinitor. Some of you may have heard that name, but Everolemus is the generic name. We have new kinds of super Everolemuses, if you like, that we're investigating that attack more than one enzyme in the same molecular pathway to try to have a better effect. One that we were very much involved in is called CC223 that inhibits two enzymes. The one that Everolemus inhibits called TORC1 and then another enzyme called TORC2. This was a, looked like a very effective drug in the clinical trial. Data is small and we clearly need more data to uh, confirm these results, but it was amazing how the majority of patients seem to have a really significant clinical benefit. We have a trial that we're launching now called BYL719 which is a so-called PI3 kinase inhibitor. It's another enzyme in exactly the same pathway as Everolemus, using it in conjunction with Everolemus. So instead of having one drug trying to hit two, two targets, we're able to use one drug hitting one target, one drug hitting another target to see if this is a better way to go. And there's some other um, multiple hit neuroendocrine tumor trials that are going on right now with these so-called mTOR inhibitors. So stay tuned. The next item I want to mention are anti-angiogenic drugs. This year, multiple clinical trials have come out and the data has been released. We don't know that they're ready for prime time, but they're sure looking interesting. This is a picture of what is called tumor neovascularity. It's a picture of the blood vessels in a tumor. Tumors induce the formation of lots and lots of really abnormal, strange blood vessels that are not the same as the blood vessels in the rest of the body. And because of that, we could actually target this blood vessel supply in the tumor with things that don't necessarily affect the blood supply going on to the rest of the body by these anti-angiogenic drugs, anti-blood vessel drugs. And without having the blood vessels nourishing the tumor, you have a dead tumor. You need the blood vessels to provide the oxygen and nutrition that a tumor needs. A study was done with Bevacizumab, also known as Avastin, in combination with Everolemus to see if that was better than Everolemus alone in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. It actually shrunk the tumors much more effectively, and it looked like it was, a, the res, that's what was meant by response rate, having at least 20% of the cancer drop dead. In 31% of people getting the combination versus 12% without the combination, the reason I say it's not ready for prime time yet is that there's more toxicity associated with it and we have to figure out a way to administer anti-angiogenics in a safer, more user-friendly way. But still, if you need to shrink cancers rapidly, that's certainly one of the ways that we can do it. And a similar study was done in carcinoid tumors with um, bevacizumab. A lot of drugs are in clinical trials right now. One of the things we've seen in 2000 and 
15, 2016 is opening up just lots and lots and lots of trials with targeted biologic agents that work on specific molecular targets. Some of these can be identified by genomic analysis of cancer, looking for specific abnormalities and then coming up with a treatment to target that abnormality. There are lots of new approaches to immune therapy, so-called immune checkpoint inhibitor drugs and other approaches to immunity. Dr. Kuntz is going to be talking to you in detail about that this afternoon. I have trials that I'm launching and in major cancer centers all around the country. People are launching trials for treating neuroendocrine cancers with various types of immune therapy. I would say another one of the major developments in this past year is finally bringing home the message to physicians in a really large scale that patients are being diagnosed too late and very ineffectively and often cancers are far more advanced and people have suffered for years unnecessarily because of a late diagnosis. We have known that in the net community for a long time, but how do you convince the doctors and insurance companies and other people in the world that this is really going on and that we need to change what is now considered standard of care practice in the United States? A study was done with patients all through the country with the major support of support groups and advocacy groups all through the country, 758 patients in America and another big cohort from Europe. Bottom line, 53% of patients required greater than two years to diagnose their neuroendocrine tumor after having really major symptoms, more than two years and 34% required more than five years. How many times did people have to go to a doctor? The number of healthcare providers in making a diagnosis, 5.7. In other words, the average patient has gone to six different doctors who misdiagnosed them before a proper diagnosis was made. That is really scary. Six different doctors, they're just doctor shopping. By the time you get to doctor number five, he starts thinking you're a mental case and you're just going around complaining because the previous four doctors couldn't find anything wrong. This is what it takes. The number of visits to doctors, number of visits to healthcare professionals before diagnosis was ever made was average of 13 visits, wasting a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of aggravation. The diagnoses that were wrong were almost always gastrointestinal diagnoses. People diagnosed as irritable bowel syndrome, gastritis, inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, ulcers, and all kinds of other stuff as you could see, including 12% of patients who were called psychiatric disorder, not otherwise specified. Okay? This data was presented to the gastroenterologists at their largest annual meeting last year and I presented it again to them this year. And uh, I think that's something we should remember. I'm gonna to have to wrap up in the interest of time, but I wanted to just leave you with uh, one or two more points. A very important trial was done of telotristat etoprate. Telotristat is a drug that stops the body from making serotonin. It, yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, okay. So telotristat etoprate. Telotristat is a drug that stops the body, the cancer cells, from making serotonin. Serotonin is the hormone that causes carcinoid syndrome. It causes flushing. It causes diarrhea. It causes damage to your heart valves. It's a bad thing to have too much serotonin in the body. So now we have a pill with very few side effects that stops the serotonin and dramatically makes things better. It has the extraordinary property that it does not pass the blood-brain barrier and get into the brain. Because if you deplete serotonin in the brain, you can become severely depressed. It does not have that effect. It only works on serotonin in the body. A randomized trial to, called Telestar has been completed. A randomization with two doses of telotristat and then telotristat maintenance after a first an evaluation period to determine how much diarrhea was happening before. The study was dramatically positive. It reduced the bowel movement frequency by an additional 35% beyond what was possible with the somatostatin analogs, octreotide or lanreotide. And the response was lasting. The 5-HIAA was markedly reduced in the urine 
We hope that in the future this will reduce things like carcinoid heart disease, although that's going to take a very long-term trial, not something that we could do in the short term. But based on these results, we're hoping before 2016 is finished that this drug will be FDA approved and will be a, a very important adjunct for managing the diarrhea of carcinoid syndrome, that patients will be able to use this in addition to octreotide and um, won't be suffering like they are now. I also wanted to mention a new quest for biomarkers. Biomarkers are things like blood tests that we do, chromogranin A, 5-HIAA, serotonin, pancreastatin. We have a lot of blood tests. But it's very hard for these blood tests to detect little tiny bits of cancer and detect changes early. And we want to have better biomarkers. That's a, sort of a national goal, one of the national goals in treating neuroendocrine tumor is to be able to have a biomarker to correlate with therapy. There's a so-called multi-gene expression assay performed on peripheral blood. So that means a normal blood test. You could identify the DNA from tumor cells that has somehow gotten into the blood. Okay? It's a very, very small amount of cancer cells that ever get into the blood. We're not talking about a leukemia. We're talking about a solid tumor in the body. But nevertheless, we can detect the tumor in the blood and analyze the DNA of the tumor cells in that specimen. So this is a test that was specifically developed for neuroendocrine tumors using 51 genes that are in the cell to determine the mutational status. And you can actually get a score that can tell you how things are doing, 3,000 samples. And theoretically, if you see the test here, a CAT scan limit of detection is approximately a billion cancer cells. Before, you can see a one centimeter tumor on a CAT scan that's a billion cells. And even with the best CAT scans and best MRIs, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of cells before you can possibly find one. The limit of detection with the net test appears to be one cancer cell in a milliliter of blood. And you could extrapolate and say how many cancer cells would be in the blood volume, 5.5 liters. You can tell if this is proportional to the amount of cancer that's actually in the body. And it seems to correlate. If you look at people with stable disease, the value of the net test assay is low. And if people are going to progress, the net test assay comes out high and often precedes the changes on the scan by as much as a year. So it a, it's a, looks like it's a sensitive test. However, it is early in development. A lot of trials are, are starting now with that test. And we have to see how this compares with other biomarkers, with other things in development, and with other genomic profilings that can be done on neuroendocrine tumors. But I think the concept of being able to evaluate a cancer gene mutation load by a blood test instead of having to do a liver biopsy every time to figure out what's going on in the cancer cells in the liver is very attractive and safer and more user friendly and at the end of the day probably will be less expensive. So I think that we should definitely keep an eye on this. So I think I'm going to stop here but I should just tell you that um, there's so much happening right now, so many clinical trials and so many really important results from clinical trials that have happened in the last year that just um, hang on to your seats and just watch the action because it's really coming thick and fast. So thank you for having me today.